But uh, my name is Jose Barzola. Thank you so much for joining our careers in peace building today. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our professor slash moderator for today, Dr. Maya Satoro Ng. Thank you again. Thank you, Jose, for all that you do for our careers in peace building and other series. Uh, and thank you for setting up the tech. Uh, again, if any of you have questions uh, that you would like for me to ask uh, George Lake today, uh, please put them in chat. Uh, we have folks from Boulder, Colorado, from Kailua, from Honolulu, um, from Waiakeakua, from Manoa, Oakland. So welcome, welcome to those of you who are in the room. Um, and welcome to George. We're so grateful that you are here uh, with us today. Uh, George Lakey is a civil rights legend, has been dubbed so by The Guardian and others. He has been active in numerous movements, uh, including anti-apartheid, labor, anti-Vietnam uh, war, um, LGBTQ plus movements, climate justice movements. He's led over 1,500 trainings on five continents. He has taught at Swarthmore College, the University of Pennsylvania, the MLK School for Social Change. He's the recipient of the Paul Robeson Award and the Martin Luther King Peace Award. His 11th book is a memoir, Dancing with History, A Life for Peace and Justice. And this is from Seven Stories Press. Uh, please do order his book if you haven't already. And welcome, George. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's, I've, I've been really tickled to get to know you better and what could be better than a dialogue on this field. <laughs> I'm really delighted as well. Um, would you begin perhaps by offering us a bit of context, a bit more about your involvement with the American Civil Rights Movement from a young age? Um, in your book, you sort of discuss that sense of mission discovered early in life. And I, I want to hear about, uh, about that and um, the development of this sort of conscious path. I was so lucky to to stumble, maybe not stumble onto this <laughs> at, at a really early age. I think it was because I was such a religious boy in a religious family. And so that opened me up, I think, in a particular way, so that at already at age 12, when the elders of the church that I went to um, noticed that I seem, seemed to have the gift of gab. <laughs> uh, they thought I might have the makings of a child preacher. And in that particular kind of Protestantism, they did believe that the gift of preaching could be given to women or even to children. And so they gave me the pulpit and said, okay, a month from now, you're going to get behind the pulpit and you're going to preach a sermon and good luck. And so I prayed earnestly to God asking what I should preach about. Now, this is 1949. This is a small town in rural Pennsylvania, all white. The only black people around were carefully on the other side of the town border. You know, it was that kind of setup, right? But what came to me was that it was God's will that there be racial equality. So that's what I preached on in a very, totally naive way, right? Um, but I, I paid attention to the scripture and especially to Jesus. And I preached a sermon that, that it was God's will there be racial equality. And then at the end, uh, when, when all was said and done and the elders got together around me at the end of the church service, instead of doing what I hoped they would do, which would be say, okay, you passed your test, you know, now you can be eligible to be a preacher around and about. Um, they basically said, don't call us, we'll call you. <laughs> and that, that was on the one hand, very disappointing. And on the other hand, I have to say, it was a kind of toughening, uh, you know, response, right? Because what it said to me then was, oh, this isn't easy. This isn't an easy road to be, to, you know, to be, uh, to be standing up for, for racial justice or anything else. Um, it, it's probably just really hard. Well, Jesus found it hard. Good grief. <laughs> he met the cross. So why should I think it would be easy? So th that kind of thing then moving to, through my adolescence, that kind of background 
and further thinking made it no great surprise that at age 19, uh, praying, dis praying really deeply for um, uh, the clear clarity about what my life was to be about, because I did think a life should be about something. And so I kept praying about that and found uh, one night the message very, very clear as I walked the beach back and forth, back and forth by the ocean. It came to me, oh, my life was to be about social change. It was about to be justice and peace. Part of um, what is embedded in your story, I think, is this notion that um, we have to be willing to be uncomfortable to um, move outside of uh, the bounds of what is customary. We have to be willing to weather many storms, as you said, for you, Jesus was a model right there. Um, but whatever um, pursuit we undertake has to uh, contain the strategy of um, reimagining or seeing with new eyes a future that is more just than the past. What are some other lessons and strategies of being a leader activist or a servant leader from your life and career. You know, I'm thinking specifically about the advice you might give uh, to our student audience. Well, uh, one of the advantages of my growing up when I did was it was just on the eve of the 60s. So I was really, really conscious, you know, when the 60s dawned upon us. I wasn't totally conscious in 1955 when the bus boycott started in Montgomery, Alabama, which was, you might say, the trumpet call, right, for the civil rights movement. But I was aware of it and then became super aware by the time that I was in my, you know, in my early 20s. And so I could follow it quite closely and participate in it. So I was in the North, but nevertheless, I managed to get myself arrested. And a very funny story that I tell in, in my memoir, um, because I made all kinds of mistakes, you know, it, it was, a, it was a, a neophyte story, right? But I did, I ended up doing the right thing and, and ended up learning so much in prison by being in a prison that was full of civil rights demonstrators who had broken the law as part of civil disobedience and were there singing and singing, teaching me songs and teaching me the phenomenal power of, of solidarity. And so I, I, I felt really lucky that through the 20s, uh, through my 20s, I kept running into both amazing mentors like Bayard Rustin, and I was able to sit at the feet of A.J. Musty and of Norman Thomas and people who had, had, you know, most of their careers behind them, but were willing to teach some, you know, some youngster who sat at their knee and asked them all kinds of questions. And, and were, they were so generous with the answers of the things that they did in this case, that case, the other case. And, and I got the idea that why I also got from my reading Gandhi, who wrote a book called Experiments with Truth, you know, that this is a wonderful field in the sense that we can experiment. It's, it's not all, you know, written down. It's not all done already. We just follow the recipe like Joy of Cooking. It's not quite that straightforward. We're going to have to do a lot of improvisation and a lot of experimenting. But for me, uh, and I know that might be daunting for some people, but for me, it was an invitation because I thought, okay, so I, I will do as my mentors say, but I will also be able to in, invent and imagine and try new things as well as use things that they've taught me. And I, I just felt so lucky about that. And one reason why I've been so uh, so uh, in, insistent on myself being open to young people now that I'm much older, is remembering the older people who gave time to me. And so I make a point of being generous with the young people who come to me for advice and teaching. That's a um, very vivid picture that you've given us. Um, I, I think that um, there's something celebratory in what you described and the community, even if there must have been fear and worry and anxiety and 
real danger at the same time. Um, can you talk a little bit more about um, nonviolent strategy and tactics in large scale conflicts? Is there real evidence? I mean, I know the answer to this, but I'd love you know your insight that the outcome is more positive if one side uses nonviolent um, strategies for social change. The clearest example that exists, I think, within the orbit of the US uh, is that we went up against a world empire, some would argue the most powerful world empire ever, the Great, Great Britain. And we fought the British Empire violently, right, with, with armed struggle. True, there were tea boycotts, there were other kinds of non-cooperation, non-violent, but non-cooperation. So I don't want to discount those, but the main, the main work was really done by the colonial army against the British. And okay, so, so that was settled in, in the sense that the British withdrew and allowed us to be independent. But nevertheless, we remained with tremendous enmity between those two countries, collision after collision after collision. The empire never fully accepted that. And then we had another war in 1812. So it was a really, uh, you know, I think a clear example of a downside of trying to make change through violence, that it's very hard to really get a peaceful peace <laughs> when even if the two sides seem to stop uh, killing for a while. Now compare that with another mass struggle against the British Empire much later in the Indias led by Gandhi. Because again, they went up against the British Empire. Uh, the empire was, if anything, way more powerful when Gandhi encountered it than when uh, when our you know our thirteen colonies encountered it, and uh, and and the, and Brit and Britain considered India to be an enormous source of wealth, much much more wealthy, uh, much more wealth to be extracted from India than there had been from our thirteen colonies, and so they really really wanted to fight for India. And Gandhi, though, was able to achieve the, the, uh, you know, the hegemony, really, of leadership in the Indian struggle, insisting on nonviolence as the price of his leadership. And so people were nonviolent. And that struggle, of course, resulted also in an exit from the empire. But hey, India was invited into a, a, a commonwealth of nations, as the British called it, you know, and the, the British really struggled to find a, a Pacific kind of way, some kind of peaceful way of relating to India into the future. So at least they could save some of the furniture <laughs> and to, uh, you know, to benefit somewhat from the Indians instead of leaving such an, a, an amount of enmity that there would be then another struggle later. So I think that contrast between the American colonies getting away from the empire and the Indians getting away from the empire is a very, very uh, clear contrast of the desirability of using nonviolence. Yes, yes. And it also speaks to perhaps relational outcomes. The paradox that Martin Luther King noted about struggle, that it supports the deepening of relationships while at the same time restructuring relationships requires that we be willing to be uncomfortable and courageous about social change. How has the civil rights movement been instrumental in restructuring relationships in um, the United States, do you think? And I'd love for you to speak a little bit on where you think we need to go from here in that regard. Well, there's so much racism remaining that it's possible, especially for young people with no historical perspective, to feel like, oh, there, you know, we, we haven't gotten anywhere. But that's really far from the truth. I mean, in let's face it, in Mississippi, when uh, when I was on the training staff for sending people to Mississippi to up, you know, upset segregation there, uh, it, it most white Mississippians considered it better for an uppity black person to be dead than, any, than anything. They were, and, and the Ku Klux Klan was a very handy instrument for killing off uppity black people. Uh, that is to say, black people who believe themselves to be equals of whites. Uh, the, the, the degree of terrorism in the Deep South, but there was also terrorism in the North, but more subtle, uh, th that, but that degree of terrorism was phenomenal. The amount of bombing and the amount of 
just outright killing and not to mention uh, less less obvious things that were done to black people what did stop for the most part stopped use well to a huge degree stopped as a result of the civil rights movement so the civil rights movement made an enormous enormous gain and it was done through the through the struggle through conflict through nonviolent direct action uh, did it handle the whole thing no because racism is too deep too deep going so no one struggle lasting let's say 15 years roughly is going to be able to handle everything but it made the biggest difference of any period of that dimension uh you know in, in my lifetime and so let's let's keep going let's not stop <laughs> this is what i would say Yes, let's. Now, I would like to ask you how you think our work for social justice perhaps has changed since um, the decades when you were first engaged in a variety of struggles, you know, and, and what excites you about the future of justice work? The thing that most excites me and is most surprising on this book tour, because now I've been book touring in nine states already, so I've gotten lots, quite a variety of audiences to share with. And what is sur most surprising to people is my perspective on polarization. That is, most people I run into regard polarization as a, a political polarization as a really, really negative sort of, uh, you know, a wet blanket on our hopes and desires for more justice. And that was also my point of view. And uh, uh, to tell you the truth, Maya, a dozen years ago, because my training is sociology, I taught sociology for years. And, and so, and sociologists tend to be, um, oh, can I say maybe preoccupied <laughs> with the question in looking at any social system, we're, we're fascinated with the question of how much uh, coherence is there within that system as compared with how much uh, friction and how much uh, struggle and how much conflict. And so I, a dozen years ago, was very, very worried about the polarization that I saw and was predicting to increase because I thought, well, if pe if we can't agree on anything, then how can we make progress toward, pe toward justice and toward peace? But then I ran into the, the research that I was doing in, in a headlong way of the Nordic countries. I was very curious about the Nordic countries because not only did they evolve a system that's far, far superior to ours with regard to equality, individual freedom, just all kinds of ways in which their system is far superior to ours. Uh, and I was very curious about how did they get there? I was, wasn't so curious about how they manage things now. I do describe that in my book, Viking Economics. And a lot of people are still reading that book, even though it's it's now whatever, five years old. But uh, what's fast, what was fascinating to me is how did they move from a century ago being a miser in miserable shape? I mean, they were in such bad shape. Norwegians were coming here. <laughs> Swedes were coming here. You know, Danes were getting out of town. They, they were all fleeing their own countries in order to seek opportunity. And now, of course, if anything, the, the immigration is the, in the other direction because they have it so much better. So I wanted to know, how did they make their leap to a far better system? And I found that they made their leap during the 1920s and 30s, which was the period of greatest political polarization that they had had in modern times. They had Nazis marching on the streets of Norway. Nazis marching in Denmark, Nazis marching in Sweden, horrible development of a, of a right wing. And then on the left wing, it was communists organizing for the dictatorship of the proletariat, you know, inspired by the Soviet Union. It was, it was just a wildly and crazily polarized time. And it was the period when they made their most progress. So I was terribly confused, to tell you the truth. I, I didn't know what to make of those facts. And I know that some Americans feel it's okay to disregard the facts, but that's not my way. I do think the facts have to be respected. So, I, okay, so, so keep looking for more cases, George. So of course I thought about the United States. I thought about the 1930s, the decade when I was born. In the 1930s, Nazis were able to free, to, to, uh, to fill Madison Square Garden for a rally. 
they were they were really really growing rapidly in the 30s in the united states and on the other hand it was the glory period of the american communist party so you had this tremendous uh, growth of polarization in the 1930s, lots of bombing going on, the Ku Klux Klan acting out, lynch, uh, lynching people, and all the rest. And at the same time, the 1930s was the period of greatest progress that we made in the first half of the 20th century. Okay, now I'm really confused. Not only are the Nordics crazy, but we're crazy too. And so, so I, I fast forward to the 60s. What was going on then? What was going on in the 60s was polarization, tremendous polarization. The American Nazi Party made a re-entry onto the scene. The right wing, the Ku Klux Klan was going wild, more bombings, lots of bombings in the 60s, lots of violence. And on the other hand, um, lots of stuff going on on the left, tremendous polarization, plus the Vietnam War meant lots of parents and children were talking to each other because of deep disagreements about the Vietnam War and, and young people fleeing to Sweden and so on, rather than participate in the Vietnam War. It was a very, very intensely polarized period. And it was a period when we made the greatest progress in the second half of the 20th century. So here am I, you know, experiencing this contradiction between what I thought was my sociological training and what the facts of the case were. Now, thank goodness I was on book tour at the time <laughs> with that book, Viking Economics. I was on book tour in Britain and I happened to be staying with an artist and the artist was, show uh, was showing me around his house, gorgeous metal sculpture. He was into metal sculpture at that time. And I said, how do you do this work with metal? Metal doesn't want to do what an artist wants to do with it. So how do you work with it? And he said, let me show you, George. And so he took me out through the back, through the kitchen, out into the backyard. That's where his studio was. He opened the door and proudly presented to me his forge. And he said, yes, George, I had to study with a blacksmith. I had to apprentice to a blacksmith to learn how to work with metal because metal doesn't want to do what I want it to do. You're quite right. So I have to heat it. I have to make it malleable. And I said, thank you. That's what polarization is. And I've been looking for a metaphor that would help me wrap my mind around this phenomenon. Polarization is a metaphor. It heats up society. It melts norms. We see norms melting all the time these days, right? We People wondering, are we going to have another free election in this country uh, that is actually respected by the party that loses? You know, we're, we're really, really noticing these melting norms. We're also noticing that the institutions are increasingly malleable. They're getting kind of squishy. And that's what forges do. They make malleable the metal that's given to them. And therefore, what polarization is best understood to be, in my view, is a forge that is heating us up now. And that's why, as in the 30s, as in the 60s, as in the Nordic countries, that's why this is, to tell you the truth, Maya, I think this is the biggest opportunity I have seen in my lifetime, I'm 85, the biggest opportunity I've seen in my lifetime to make major progressive change. And just in time with the climate on our backs, right? Just in time to be able to make major changes. I think that is available because of this polarization. And, and to tell you the truth, Maya, when I tell the, my perspective, the one I just described, to audiences, uh, it, on the West Coast, on the East Coast, it, now here in Colorado, where you caught me right now, people, people's eyes, it, it's just amazing to watch. And the questions they ask, they, they say, wow, you mean there's actually hope? I, I've been feeling anxious, anxious, anxious because of what's going on. And you're saying there's actually bigger opportunity. Okay, now to be, to be honest, I want to be honest, polarization does hurt. It does hurt right? It brings a lot of violence with it. It brings a lot of hurt, 
with it. So I don't want to sound like an optimist and say, oh, now things are better. You know, the, the pink puffy clouds come in or something like that. No, 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 no. It's way, way stern, sterner than that. Furthermore, it is like a forge, polarization is, in that the forge doesn't care what comes out, what we make of the metal. So in Germany, for example, while the Nordics were moving ahead toward progress, toward social democracy, in Germany, they were moving to Nazism and Hitler. In Italy, the polarization happening at about the same time resulted in fascism. It resulted in Mussolini. Forge didn't care. Forge has no opinion <laughs> because polarization had no opinion about what's to come out of it. It couldn't care less. It's really up to us. It was up to the Germans and Italians whether their outcome would be fascism. It was up to the Nordics to decide, no, no, no. We want our outcome to be the greatest degree of democracy probably ever in the history of the world. What is our, what is our determination? I'm proud that in the 30s, we used polarization period in order to make further progress. That's when the unions got really established, right? That's when women took st further steps forward. That's when all kinds of good things happened. And then in the 60s again, in the 70s, racial relations got way, way better as a result of the civil rights movement. And again, the union movement flourished and lots of other movements, educational reform, lots of good things. The environmental movement got going in that period. So lots of good things happened in the 60s because we were up for it. We were up for the struggle. And so that's why I'm so glad you invited me to talk about this today, because I am personally up for the struggle. I'm 85. I'm glad to be with you, Maya. I want to be, <laughs> I want to be with you on this chance around. You understand? And at the same time, one reason I want to be with you is to make it more likely that we can make the most of this opportunity. And again, I, I don't want to sugarcoat this. I, I want to admit my family will walk into the kitchen in the morning and see me on my eating my granola, reading the newspaper and crying because I see so much hurt that is coming from the polarization. Yes, the forge is very hard on the metal. <laughs> I imagine if you could ask the metal its opinion, it would say, no, we do not want to be heated. <laughs> And so I understand that, and my heart is moved by that. And at the same time, if we're going to suffer, then let's suffer for a cause. Let's suffer to make things better rather than to pull our tents in around us, feel our anxiety grow and grow, and, and, and give up. Oh, there's so much in what you just said that... Um, fills me with feeling and also inspires new questions. Um, um, but your energy is most appreciated and is exciting. Um, in what you just said, there are answers to this next question, but I wanted to ask you to speak a little more about the sword as, um, as a word, as a metaphor, in the discussion of nonviolence, it's obviously surprising, right? And uh, you, um, you've shared with us some of what makes it a useful metaphor, but I wonder if you have anything else to add to that, you know, just in terms of, you know, why you chose the sword. Well, what I love about the skills of negotiation and conciliation, and I've used those myself on many occasions when there's a conflict, what I love about it is that it very often is able to produce a win-win between two, two uh, folks who are disagreeing, right, or two entities who are disagreeing. And it most often is able to pull that off, as you know very well, because that's an expertise of yours, uh, when the parties that are having a disagreement are of equal power or equal status. Uh, it's way, way easier to do that. When, when the two parties are of unequal status, in fact, when one party is actually dominating the other, that's when uh, conciliation and, uh, and, and the, the skills of negotiation don't 
usually get anywhere because the top dog, as Johan Galtung, the great conflict theorist in Norway, a uh, sociologist who, who specialized in conflict, Johan Galtung called it top dog, bottom dog. He said, when, when the top dog is actually getting its goodies from its domination of the bottom dog, it has no incentive whatever to compromise, right? It loves being where it is. <laughs> and in fact, uh, inflates its good opinion of itself and imagines that it is brighter and more meritorious and more able to, you know, it sees a bigger picture and so on. It's full of, it's full of, uh, you know, self-fulfilling praise because it's been on the top for usually for a, a long enough time so that it can be teaching its children that, that they're better than other people and their children's children, they're better than other people and so on. Uh, my lover is a, is a millionaire. And, and so he's introduced me, you know, to his, to to people in that realm and i get to see all these phenomenally inflated egos <laughs> and and the ego comes from their their place in society as the dominators of the rest of us well i was brought up working class so i had the advantage of growing up with a more much more realistic picture of society on the other hand the downside of the way i grew up was i grew up with a sense of inferiority I brought, especially from my dad, but also from my mom, we, we are not the betters, right? We're the people who are meant to serve. We're the people who are not equal to those who know better, who see the bigger picture, and by the way, have lots of money. And so, um, so, so because of that structural difference between the top dog and the bottom dog, uh, we, what we need is, uh, I, I love that phrase, for that purpose, the sword that heals. What we need is a sword that will sever the ties, the invisible ties that keep each party in its place. The invisible ties that tell uh, only class people, for example, or white people, or uh, you, you know, invading people, uh, keeps telling them, oh, you're better, you're better, you're better because you're on top. And the invisible ties that tell the underdog, um, uh, you, you're, you're inferior, you're inferior, you know, you're, women sometimes grow up with that feeling of being inferior to men. Uh, it, all these top dog, bottom dog relationships have built in this kind of uh, psychic uh, uh, program that that says we're, we're we're in the you know we're we're, we're subservient if we're subservient we, we deserve to be or if we run things we deserve to be running things and and so what what needs to be severed and the sword is just a very dramatic <laughs> i must say very dramatic way of describing that but it does get our attention right uh it's it's, it's the idea it, it, maybe scissors is better so what we need is to snip 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 <laughs> all those things and because it requires power to do the snip snip snipping i wish it were just a tailor's job but because it requires power like the civil rights movement or like gandhi's movement then it, it's a Darn good thing when that movement figures out nonviolence is the way to go, because it is itself an educational process. It builds, as I saw so often in the civil rights movement, it builds the, um, the internal sense of dignity and worth on the part of black people to go into nonviolent struggle with white people. And it raises questions for the white people who are, who are on top whoa, you know, if, if we're better, why are we shooting people down? You know, or why are we beating people up just because they want a cup of coffee? You know, it, it starts to, it starts to erode. It, it starts to snip away these self-fulfilling um, beliefs on the part of the top dogs, especially the economic top dogs, that uh, they they have a right to be there in the current United States. They have a right to take more and more of the national income for their own personal possession and leave greater and greater poverty on the part of uh, of the American uh, working class. They believe that it's okay to do that, right? And they need to learn. And I think the best learning is to say, no, you can't do that anymore, period. Boom, done, you're done, you're fired. 
<laughs> and guess what? You now have a chance to find out who you really are, a really solid base for self-respect, which is not the domination of others, but is a recognition of your own true worth because you have worth too. Your worth does not depend on, on running other people's lives. Your worth does not depend on running the American empire. Your worth is given from God. You have an inherent worth. How about respecting that? Well, thank you. I want to show you here. Do you see this sword? That's Whoa. <laughs> so that, that's another um, sword in another culture. That's uh, Indonesian kris. Oh. It's a sacred dagger, which is often worn in the back uh, oh. to symbolize violence as a last resort. But what's interesting oh. to me and what you just um, shared is that the kris is made, the blade, with layer upon layer, sometimes hundreds of layers requiring months. Uh, the umpu or the swordsmith, you know, um, also makes each kris um, as a symbol of uh, cultural identity and spiritual identity for the maker, uh, for the owner rather. Mm -hmm. And um, the owner has to sleep with it underneath the pillow um, and have his or her dreams interpreted in order to determine whether uh, that particular kris, which is believed to contain a spirit, is well suited uh, to the recipient. And the reason they do so many layers very often is with each layer, the hybridization of the metals makes the sword stronger. And so there's a beautiful sort of added metaphor of layering in multiple identities and uh, in order to forge a stronger blade. And so it's a, a lovely kind of cross-cultural <laughs> um, metaphor. Within your story is, of course, um, a commitment to um, what our friend uh, John Paul Lidrock um, has called conflict transformation, right? I mean, we see mm -hmm. these symbols yeah. of conflict um, as potentially uh, the very source of possibility. You've spoken a lot about waging you know, conflict rather than resolving it in the sense of feeling and finding um, uh, the opportunities that are embedded in conflict to um, renew our commitments, to know where we need to place our resources, our energy, mm -hmm. our, um, uh, our commitments uh, and our time. Uh, we um, see conflict as um, uh, an opportunity, in other words, to better ourselves, improve society, and uh, reshape everything um, with that cutting, right? With the this or with the the bringing of fire and flame. So, can you speak a little bit more about how uh, we can reimagine conflict? Um, and in our own lives, take full possession of this shift in mindset? Well, it, it has been tremendously helpful to me to hear lots of stories from other people about the actual encounters, those conflictful encounters, and what they can do that's creative in order to bring that amazing sword with its hybrid character uh, to bear, right? And um, one reason why I'm in, on this book tour, also encouraging people to take a look at the short a paper book, a paperback called How We Win, which I published, um, I guess, four years ago, is that How We Win is a manual it's like a first aid handbook. It's a manual for how to do nonviolent conflict, nonviolent campaigns, nonviolent efforts to change things and bring about justice. And the the book is just chock full of specific examples, and that's stories and so on. And one reason why I do that is because 
I've saved my life several times, like uh, uh, attack, you know, attacks with knives, and just d difficult things, um, because what's flo flown into my mind at the critical moment, <laughs> I remember one guy had, had his knife um, one inch from my belly, <laughs> and he was, he was, a, he was from v Vietnam, he's on furlough from Vietnam, he was gung-ho soldier, right, really believing in the Vietnam War, I just gotten off the off the box on the street railing against the vietnam war so he felt personally attacked right so so when then i got off the box and uh and somebody else took my place was speaking and i was just in the crowd paying attention to the speaker this guy comes closer 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 to me i pay a lot of attention in crowds to what's going on so i notice he's coming closer closer i see him out of the corner of my eye and then he looks directly at me so i look at him his eyes look down which means my eyes are supposed to look down my eyes do look down and his knife is open and an inch from my belly and he says i'm just back from nam fuck you and it's clear that he's about to plunge the knife into my belly. And I remembered his story at that second about how somebody got out of a tough situation. And so I looked him in the eyes and I said, I know you can hurt me, but think for a minute about the possible consequences for you. And he heard in my voice a concern for his well-being. At the same time, of course, it's a big concern for my well-being. And he looked at me for a second and put away his knife and quietly left the crowd. So I'm a great believer in our learning from the experience of others in tight situations. And so I feel that that book is a short book, How We Win, but it's just chock full of yummy, <laughs> yummy examples that I think will stand us well, especially in a period of polarization. Thank you for that example, um, where you were confronted with violence firsthand and your book, uh, before I continue, I'd like to invite people who are watching on Facebook Live or the uh, those of you who are in this room to please um, include questions of your own. Um, I have a couple more questions that, after which I'd love to uh, ask your questions of George. But um, George, I wanted to ask, um, you know, Dancing with History is such a personal book right and whereas how we win you just referenced is a is more of a pragmatic step-by-step -step, um design on how to create powerful direct action campaigns yeah can you speak a little bit um from the perspective of a storyteller how was your experience different in writing this more personal narrative and did it make you feel vulnerable to share all of these deeply personal stories or was that liberating and satisfying can you just talk about the difference for us oh my <laughs> talk about vulnerable i mean you're right because i i previously had published 10 books but all of those were about a subject that i could make uh separate from myself right so i could be writing about something over there across the street <laughs> but with a memoir the whole point is to be writing about oneself and so i had no critical distance i count on you know i was trained academically in sociology i have i'm supposed to have some some objectivity about whatever I'm writing about, but I have no objectivity about me or not a whole lot. And so it was really tough work and wonderful work because it was it was itself a, you know, an exercise, you might say, a spiritual exercise. Can you, George, get enough of the pers likely perspective of readers so that you can tell stories within your, 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 but tell your own stories, not other people's stories this time, it's your stories, and, uh, and, and, and make them plausible and uh, explain the, you know, fill, fill in the blanks where people are likely to be asking questions. Well, yeah, but what about that? Well, what about that? And uh, try to put yourself in the shoes of the reader uh, and also be faithful to yourself. And yes, sometimes I was very vulnerable. So I'm, so I'm the word out in the uh, you know in the circuit where people tell talk to each other about 
about the book. Uh, one word that's used is, he's so explicit. <laughs> And that's because I'm not trying to dodge anything. Yes, I yes I am bisexual. Yes, I had a, a wonderful marriage and big family. I have six great grandchildren. You know, so the the heterosexual part is very clear. And at the same time, yes, I can love men also. And so I talk about male lovers and and adventures that we've had together. And um, yeah, yeah. It's so it's it's out there. And 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 because I did feel that. Being, being a memoirist uh, requires honesty. Uh, and so I wanted to be honest. And, uh, and, and, and many times I was blushing as I was writing. And then the back and forth with the editors, you know, like, George, uh, have you gone too far here? You know, or mm, George, uh, there you can tell you're holding back, you know, and that kind of thing going on. Uh, so it was, it, you are totally right in in suggesting that it was a, an exercise of vulnerability. But the other side of it is, what's nonviolence but vulnerability, right? So in a way, it was taking the vulnerability that Dr. King experienced in daily life. He never knew when he was going to be killed. He was pretty sure he, would, he knew he was going to be killed. But, but you know, when, um, talk about vulnerable. He's such an idol for me. I have two photographs of two, uh, you know, photographs in on the wall in my in my office. Um, yeah, so so vulnerability seems to go with a nonviolent commitment, and so in that way, I was being consistent. It wasn't a big departure in that way. Well, thank you. It feels like an act of generosity, this book, um, and the sharing of your soul, your spirit, your, your experiences. And we're very grateful. Mm. Um, I want to ask, um, you know, you've shown a preference for facilitated leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and I wondered if you could speak a little bit more about that. You know, part of what you're suggesting is that government processes um, and structures are insufficient. Um, can you speak a little bit about the, you know, the experiences that um, that have shaped your vision of leadership, and you know what we might uh, take from that? Yeah. Well. Uh, as a sociologist, I'm always thinking about roles, roles we play, right? And the thing about a role is it opens up a set of skills and a set of perceptions that enable us to get things done. That's great. At the same time, it closes off other perceptions that would just get in the way, you know, or might get in the way because we have a job to do in the role we play. So the role of leader uh, opens things up, enables us to get things done, enables us to notice things that other people might not notice. So that's all the great. But on the other hand, there are other things, still other things that we won't notice because we can't notice everything. Nobody can notice everything, not when they're in, in some role. And so, or, or at all, really. So um, so the thing about facilitation as a, as a leadership style is it really puts a big weight on what is the group going to bring forward? So in those, you know, over a thousand workshops that you referred to, uh, I was constantly there with the question, even though I, I didn't, I, you know, I looked, so I knew what I was doing. Well, I did, you know, it wasn't, I was, uh, oh gosh, what are we going to do now? It wasn't that. No, no, no. We, I knew what, it, but on the other hand, I was constantly asking myself, and what does the group hold that I don't know about? <laughs> Where is the leadership in the group that's about to come forward? It might come forward in the in the in a question that somebody raises. It might come forward in the form of acting out. You know, maybe somebody's going to launch a rebellion against my leadership. Oh, that would be it. that would be exciting. I, I look forward to that. So uh, it was so that that was the way I saw facilitation as a kind of leadership that I was really in partnership with the group, uh, 
The group didn't always know it was in partnership with me because I was coming on strong. And yet it very much was. And there were times when I would simply say, oh, whoa, this group is on the verge of something really exciting. It's, it, it wants transformation. And what my best behavior now would be would be to just be quiet. And I would just sit there and try to imagine myself being a Buddhist monk sitting, you know, quietly praying. And uh, so I would try my Buddha posture while they were, they would get into it and they would get into a, a storm, what we, what I call a storm. Well, I, that was no originality. I learned it from a group dynamics expert. You can call it a storm. And, and there they are like fighting it out and so on. Very exciting. And I also know that my job as a facilitator is to make sure that everybody stays because it's more likely to be going they'll go through the storm to the other side more successfully if everybody stays so sometimes i would have to jump up and stop somebody at the door and or <laughs> insist that they go back <laughs> because they're not going to want to you know beat me up in order to get out so they'll go back in the group and keep the storm but this, because the storm is uncomfortable for some members of the group and 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 then you know a storm can go for half an hour 45 minutes it could be 10 minutes it could be an hour uh, and, and so the sheer uncertainty of it, it looks very different from the way I started the workshop, but it's because I was changing gears in order to allow the group's own uh, wisdom and artistry about itself, its own sense of direction to come forward. And it was, it was always very, very exciting. And at the end, of course, they would be in a big honeymoon stay with themselves. They would all be in love with each other and maybe even a little bit of love for me. And it, it, we'd be having these great times. So I, I just loved uh, workshopping. I can't do it anymore because my brain, I'm 85. I can't hold all the complexities that go on in a group. It's just enormously complex. And my brain just can't hold it all anymore, so I refuse workshop participation, workshop f facilitation. But that period of whatever it was, 40 years or something, when I was doing it, 50 years, 40 years, I guess, um, was a great joy because groups, oh my gosh, you know, I, I was the closest I could come to being maybe an explorer in a new continent or something. You know, when I get to the top of this mountain, what will I see on the other side? You know, I, I felt like I had a bit of that sense of exploration. <laughs> From our vantage point, your brain still works very well. So um, I appreciate those 40 plus years of workshopping. And I love that image of um, are being intrepid, you know, explorers, this idea of perhaps um, being in community, being upstanders as having that explore mindset. That's the very definition of leadership and where we, we need to go now. And of course, here in Hawaii, we talk a lot about navigational leadership, right? And that, that explore mindset that is so present as we navigate through innumerable storms <laughs> I, I love i love all of that and your energy and enthusiasm i want to make sure that we get to a couple of questions yeah, um, yeah. there's one here by uh carolyn stevenson has asked um hi george good to see you again there are at least three students here from my nonviolent action course and i have suggested to them that they look at the nonviolent action database that you created at swarthmore could you talk a bit about that wonderful resource well it it there's never been a database where you could just go online, never before ours, just go online and and type uh, a country that you're curious about. Did, did they have nonviolent struggles in that country? Because we have struggles from almost 200 countries in the world. Or you might uh, search for what was going on in the 19th century. Is nonviolence a new, new invention from Gandhi or something and nobody ever did it before? Guess what? We discovered, the students um, at Swarthmore discovered nonviolent struggles that went back to the days of the pharaohs. So we are talking about a very, very old tradition that for the most part didn't get written about. I mean, we, you can find it in the historical records, but for the most part didn't get celebrated because people all were tended to be, you know, mesmerized by violence, violence, violence is the way to do conflict. But here's this amazing uh, invention called a nonviolent struggle that goes way back then. So we ended up, let's see, it's still underway, but I think the latest count is 1400 different nonviolent direct action campaigns from almost 200 countries. 
um, going back, as I said, to the pharaohs and by different groups of people. There are women's struggles, there are black people's struggles, there are anti-colonial struggles, there are lots of, of climate struggles or environmental struggles, of course, because students these days are very interested in, in environment, so there a lot of students could explore those. Um, and the students were, after I taught them the basic uh, how it works, they were, they were, you know, they, they could just go out and explore into the great world. They got help from the research librarian and they would find so many amazing things that come back in the next week. Guess what I found? It, it, was, it was just a tremendous celebration. And as I say, it was a, a wake up to many of my colleagues on the faculty who had no idea. I mean, for, for some of the young ones, they thought it was something Dr. King invented, you know, and had no idea. It had this old, old history and, and the, the struggles were waged by so many different kinds of people, you know, on a neighborhood level, neighborhoods standing up for themselves, on a city level, state level, national level, uh, even international level. And and there and and therefore we never have to just go into the streets again and do a protest because there's always a more creative way to launch a campaign and to wage a campaign. And so if you're feeling a little bit like, oh, there's something that bothers me, we should do another protest. Stop right there. Go online, nonviolent action database. <laughs> Just look for it, nonviolent direct action database or nonviolent, what is it, campaign, nonviolent campaign database. And um, the, um, Anne you, Wright has kindly put it uh, in the chat. Oh, thank you, Anne. You who are here in the room, it's nvdatabase.swarthmore.edu. Oh, thank you, thank you. A great thing about 85 is we can accept so much help from others. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yes, I, I, I bet a lot of the people on this call will find themselves delighted that there's so much information available very close to hand. <laughs> it's, wonderful. it's wonderful, thank you. Anne also asks um, you to tell us about going on the Phoenix sailboat to challenge the U.S. war in Vietnam during the war and notes that, you know, the peace boat, that, that um, they are still sailing boats to break the illegal Israeli blockade of Gaza and, and uh, to wage peace and, and um, in a variety of ways. But could you tell us a little bit about your boat going adventures? Oh, I was so excited to hear about the one block, uh, challenging the blockade of Israel. I was so, so excited about that. Yeah, so the thing that I personally got involved with because I was leading, helping to lead a group uh, called a Quaker group that was doing anti-Vietnam War work and uh, realized that one of the things that was in the way, we, we joined that struggle very early and realized there wasn't a mass movement that we needed yet because so many Americans didn't know that Vietnamese people were actually people were actually human beings because after all they were these these colored folks from way you know across the world who knew you know and 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 so what needed to happen in order to arouse americans to go up against the economic elite to go up against the american empire and stop that horrible war what was needed was for americans to know that the vietnamese are real human beings so we thought one way to dramatize that is to take medical aid to them, to the civilians who are suffering under the war. And that seems like almost anybody would say, oh yeah, people who are innocently suffering under war should get medical aid. Yeah, well, okay, okay. So it seemed like a fairly, you know, common sense, really reasonable humanitarian act. The only trouble was that the American Seventh Fleet <laughs> Was was guarding and blockading the uh, the Vietnamese coast, so that that couldn't happen. So that meant a collision. And the other wonderful thing about that uh, campaign was that we knew that it would take a while to unfold because we were using a sailboat. We weren't using a quick boat. It was a sailboat. It would take a while to get across the you know the, the North uh, China, the South China Sea. And so in that process. 
uh, there would be buildup of publicity. And sure enough, we were on Hunley Brinkley, at, you know, in the evening, the evening news, CBS News, Walter Cronkite, and all, all of the big TV channels were following what was going on with our little sailboat, the Phoenix, only 50 feet long, only eight people on it. But we were uh, commanding the attention of the American public because there was the question, what's going to happen? Are they going to be bombed out of the war to water? You know, is that what's going to happen? Or what? And actually, it got through. The Phoenix got through with the medical supplies to North Vietnam. And then I felt led by God to join the crew of the South Vietnamese voyage because we, again, wanted to emphasize this is not about choosing sides. We're not trying to say one side is better than the other side. We're very against the American empire doing this thing, but we're also emphasizing the human catastrophe that's going on. And so we want to go to South Vietnam and give our medical supplies to the Red Cross of South Vietnam and to the Buddhist church in South Vietnam. And so we, uh, we went to South Vietnam and I was on that voyage. And so in the book, Dancing with History, I do tell quite the adventure stories of mixing it up, you know, when they were jump, they were boarding our our ship, you know, and they were they were they crashed into our mizzen boom and broke it. And oh, my goodness, it, it's really I must say I'd wrestled. There were moments when I'd rather wrestle with this uh, guy, you know, with a knife uh, close to my belly than dealing with these warships, because these warships look really menacing. <laughs> so all, all those adventures are, uh, are in the book, Dancing with History. <laughs> you need to read the, the book, and, and Anne also adds, and the Quaker boat Golden Rule was in Hawaii in 1958 um, on the way to try to stop atmospheric nuclear testing and was also in Hawaii 2019 and 2021 and is now on the East Coast after two weeks in Cuba. So that's that's uh, wonderful. Um, David Silverman adds here, um, way back in moving towards a new society, you and Moyers at all developed scenarios for parallel national electoral and non-electoral direct action coalitions. Um, and, um, I think you only have a couple of minutes to uh, answer this final question as we are out of time, but what is your prognostication and prescription for such campaigns over the next few cycles? And as the right and neoliberal led nationalist movements increasingly coordinate globally, what coordinated options and or, or alternatives do you envision for the nonviolent movements in the coming period? So those are really dense, meaty questions, David. <laughs> we only have two minutes left. But I, I, you know, I, I thank you for doing your best in two minutes and thank you for being here today. Yeah. Well, I can give an example and in that way it re respond. The example would be uh, with regard to electoral means, trying to change our country by electoral means sufficiently so that we can have a, a future to be excited about. Um, the, the, uh, the illustration I would use is Medicare for all. Medicare for all, which is something that is deeply, deeply needed, including in the rural states where lots and lots of working class people are voting Republican and supporting Donald Trump because they don't know that it's possible to meet their medical needs in some way. There is that way that was introduced by Bernie, and uh, it is a way that is not picked up by the Democrats. Why isn't it picked up by the Democrats? It will not happen, even though it could strike into the you know the heart of the Trumpians by uh, uh, by uh, by showing that the Democrats are on the side of working class people who have very big medical needs, and in the rural states especially, hospitals are closing and everything else is getting worse. And the Democrats will not do it. They absolutely refuse to pass Medicare for all. Medicare for all is done by the Nordics, but it's done in Germany. It's done in Holland. It's done in many, many civilized countries. It is not done in the US because the economic elite doesn't want it to be done. 
And as soon as there got to be that interest, the a public interest in Medicare for all, and a majority polled said, yeah, we want Medicare for all. As soon as that majority showed up in the polls, more money got funneled to the Democratic uh, senators and the Democratic representatives for their campaigns. Medi you know, money from the, the pharmaceutical firms, medic money from the medical uh, insurers and so on. It, the obvious thing, buy them off. The, the Democratic Party shows each time there's a showdown of that kind that it is willing to be bought off. So the evidence is very clear. I'm not making this up. It is clearly evidential that we cannot count on the Democrats. So I, I was a lifelong Democrat. But we cannot count on the Democrats to deliver what needs to be delivered because they will simply be bought off. We must instead take the non-electoral route, which means the route of mass movements using nonviolent direct action in a strong enough way so that we can bring about a nonviolent revolution, which will overthrow the power of the top dog, which is the economic elite in our country. It's been running the country for a long time. It's been running the empire because it loves to have an empire. And we will never be free of the rule of the economic elite until we have a nonviolent revolution. That was done. I describe it in Viking economics. That was done by the Nordics. That's why they do so much better. They did their nonviolent revolutionary job. We haven't gotten around to that job yet. I just, I am so glad to be 85 and with us because this time, thanks to increased polarization, I think we can amass the sheer numbers of people it's going to be required to wage a successful nonviolent revolution and at last have a democratic United States. There was a lot there. Uh, <laughs> so sorry that we um, have to close this particular webinar, but um, continue to um, uh, dance, George, and uh, we will uh, certainly be dancing partners with you. There are a number of wonderful comments uh, in the chat, as well as some additional resources, for instance, a link to George's comments about Ukraine and so on. Um, thank you all for listening, for being here, for participating in our careers in peace building series and for engaging and supporting in innumerable um, uh, peace building actions. Uh, we hoped you we hope you enjoyed today, of course, but um, hope you will also join us uh, for our social justice and, and future careers in peace building. These recordings can be found on our YouTube channel at the Matsunaga Institute for Peace. Once again, thank you to Jose for organizing us. Um, and we bid you uh, abundant aloha for now. Thank you, George, for this stimulating conversation. Aloha. <laughs>